where now India in the last three years have really leapfrogged the number of households, the number of individuals about 50, 15 years of age who have accounts, you know, that, that number is a staggering 80% plus now. Or you look at digital transactions that are happening in the country. In the last three years, just the sheer number of digital transactions that are happening, which is enabling a lot of other parts of the business, is really something which we should give full credit to the banking industry. Of course, there are challenges, and those challenge, challenges have to be dealt by. What we will now do is get into each of our, we will get into the stories of each of our panelists and understand what they have been doing. Let's start with, so let's start with the Bank of India, sir. Uh, sir, what I have done is I have picked up a few things from your analyst reports, from your presentations, uh, your annual reports. So there are many things that you pick up, right? For example, you pick up something around Mission Samadhan, how the whole OTS scheme has been formulated for quick recovery, your RAM advances, your star points of contact. And of course, no wonder Q1 FI18 results have been outstanding in terms of recovery. Uh, on top of that, we are also aware that the government of India has launched a massive transformation program by the name EASE, where there are six pillars, right, from customer responsiveness to reach responsible banking to credit offtake to developing personal for brand business. So we would really like to hear your perspectives on three points, sir. One, given your Q4 performance, what was done special around recovery? How does Bank of India think about current transformation themes? And finally, one of the challenges that we see in public sector banks is changes happen, but they often get reversed. How do you make some of these changes irreversible? Thank you, Asis. Of course, uh, as far as recovery is concerned, we have done well. If you see all banks, and BSV in particular, they think recovery is the last thing to be attended. And only when they have some challenges or somebody tells them that account is not performing well, then they start thinking on that. That was just very different setup, you know, arrangement with PSV banks. We thought that unless you have a specific number, specific percentage of manpower for your processing, your managing the credit, simply because of firefighting not help. So we started this mission Samadhan one year before. We, we, we got one board approved, non-discriminatory and non-discriminatory and non-discretionary. A template-based OTS model, which was given to the branches, you may be knowing, uh, down the line, people are not very keen to take that haircut and you know, get that uh, I mean, OTS done. To enable them, we convinced the board and board approved one policy from one floor to 35 floors and that was rolled out one year before and that helped. But that was a policy decision by the board. Whatever policy you do, unless it is implemented and you have machinery to implement, you will not get results. We are lucky, of course, we got the right kind of response. Uh, we could recover around 10,000, 12,000 crores during the quarter. That, uh, that is how we reduced our net NPA from 10.2 to 8.2. It is a great moral booster for everybody. And that system is working well. I am quite hopeful with the support of IBC and other results will be doing well this quarter also. That Mr. Samadhan worked well and that was supported by board driven policy which was non-discriminatory, non-discretionary and template based. Just tick, 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 then go for decision making. That was the uh, beginning and that helped a lot. And that far as your uh, you know, transformation, this is a continuous journey. You know, almost all of you know that it's nothing, it's a dynamic situation, nothing is permanent, nothing is constant, you have to change continuously. But certain things, particularly PSE banks, I was, when I was a CEO of Singapore, uh, I saw how the private, uh, how the banks across the country, they perform. You know, you, unless you change, if you continue to believe that you are the greatest, and you are the mightest, and you are the best, then you will be thrown out. 
So we started that change from very being opposed to, because of certain constraints, we couldn't engage, you know, right kind of uh, consultant for this purpose. But whatever experience and expertise we gained through our banking experiment journey, we started doing that. For example, you know, all the PSA banks, if you see, uh, today most of journal headquarters are handling 150, 125 branches. Most of the journal managers may not be knowing the name of the brand managers, how to motivate, how to engage with employees. So what we did, not, not like that you know, old model, we started 112, uh, last year was our foundation, 112 uh, year of celebration. We started 112 key centers across the country, mapped to 25, 25 to 30 branches. It's not like that another layer of administrations. The young high people who call them know that kind of, you know, catalyst, uh, um, um, I mean, officers. And they were placed to, placed close to the 30 35 branches. They were monitoring and managing and handholding and going for camp and campaign approach. That helped them uh, to engage the manpower. You may be knowing most of the publisher banks, you know, 20% of branches are not performing. 20% of the branches are loss making branches. It's a huge drag on the you know, arrangement. So we started to engage with the branches and you know, give them the scope and support so that they can deliver, they can themselves generate business and get some you know, profit so that they will be enthused to contribute. So that transformation started of course many things. We started Project Connect. The Project Connect was connect with the staff members, connect with the client. Because your internal customers, your staff members should be connected well, and then your constituents, your clients should be connected. Project, under that project connect, we started that 112 you know, key centers, and that galvanized the entire activity of our branches today, except seven branches, all branches are profit making. So that's a great uh, you know, support for all of us, and I have committed to the, you know, our uh, owner and regulator that will make all branches profit making so that there will be no loss to people. Well. No, we need not go to any branch, because let them be active, let them support, let them come back to the mainstream. So that is one of the uh, you know, various transformations. And the third aspect is very, very important, as is, you say, you know, this is <laughs> irreversible, but I believe it is always reversible. Because no change will be constant. But today, what we do is individuals change the system changes. But that is the main problem of you know all institutions and PSC, PSC is particular. Because, because you see CEO will come for two years, one and a half years, managers will change within one, one and a half years. They will not understand they will everybody will have his own way of doing. That is not the right kind of thing that will not give, to, give uh, I mean, the support and sustenance to the organizations. That is most important, but how to make it sustainable? How to make it permanent, not permanent in the sense of permanency, but it should be, the system should be in place whether you are there or not. The main thing in population banks, of course, we engage with consultant. Long back 2005, we started engaging consultant. But consultants, they came, they gave very good you know, prescription, but ultimately didn't work out with the brands, you know, banks. Mostly because people were not onboarded. You know, change should happen within. You know, what, what they say, if the egg is broken from the outside, you get a dead light. If it's taken from inside, you get real light. So unless that light is, I mean, you know, uh, light is coming out of the egg, and the people are onboarded properly, it will not be such a good. Of course, there are many th things are there, but this I will be highlighting for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was. Uh... Well, thank you, sir. Uh, I think there is also something for consultants to take from this message. But you need to get consultants also in, guys. So please, the audience may take point of uh, you know that particular factor. Thank you, Edmund, sir. So I will call Mr. Mopatras and Bank of India's transformation as transformation by gaining momentum. I think really the kind of mobilization, the kind of energy that has been enthused in in the network, and you know, coming from 20% of your branches down to just few branches which are not profitable is a remarkable uh, feat, sir. Congratulations, and we wish Bank of India all the best. Let's change gears. Let's move on. So we should be, I did a very similar thing for RBL, and I will call your transformation as scale without scale. And I say that because I think uh, without owning a very expensive distribution, you have really gone and 
did that, done a fantastic job with the distribution with very few branches, a large number of BC network. You have done a, again, you have really reached out, and especially the, one of the target segments you have is financial inclusion, which is very interesting. I think you have also been investing in platforms, and I think the whole uh, analytics, uh, we heard that in, in the earlier part of the day, has been very interesting for you. In addition to this, you know, I also want to throw in one, uh, one new angle to the story. Uh, recently, BCG, uh, BCG uh, collaborated with Google to do a whole digital lending study. And our take is that in India, in five years from now, the digital lending will just multiply by five times. So from, say, about $75 billion of digital lending, it will go all the way to $350 billion of digital lending. I say this because digital is one of your core platforms. So my questions to you are the following. At RBL, when you started the journey five, six years back, what were your handicaps and how did you convert them into an advantage? You are doing a great job. You have done a great job in partnerships and technology. Do you think as the rest of the world catches up, will these levers continue to be your differentiators? And for you, NBFCs can be a potential competitors. They are far more mobile. They can attack in a very different manner. What is the future agenda for for RBI? Thanks, Ashish. Uh, in our case, uh, I mean, first of all, you know the the, the story that Mr. Mahapatra just related is absolutely admirable. Uh, our story is uh, very different in the sense that. Uh, this is about seven years ago when we stepped into what was then called Ragnarkar Bank Limited. What we were looking at was a, a very, very small bank, very regionally and narrowly focused. It was literally in one and a half states of the country, you know, southern Maharashtra, bit of northern Karnataka, nothing else. Uh, uh, Underinvested in platforms, hardly any technology manually run operations, fully unionized workforce, and uh, so on and so forth. So the challenge of so-called transformation or turnaround, you know, it was a full 360 degree reboot or rebuild of the institution. Now, in a situation like that, uh, you, there are, you know, many things that need to change. Literally the whole thing has to change. At the same time, you know, there are existing legacy issues, there are people and so on and so forth. So I want to throw out this point that how did we think and go about this? And, and we, 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 we uh, broke it down to a few things which we said all have to happen. First was the fact that we said transformation cannot happen, like he said very rightly, it has to happen from within. So, I mean, I'm invoking, I mean, recently we lost one of our greatest ex-prime ministers, one of the greatest statesmen of the country, Mr. Vajpayee. And he had this concept Sabka Saat, Sabka Vikas, and you know, embodied the concept of inclusiveness. We said that's the only way of doing it. If you chop, shrink the pie, you know, uh, put severance packages, you know, that's not the way to go about it. Because, uh, so the first thing we did was basically made sure that we are going to be a very inclusive organization where change has to happen from within. At the same time, there has to be scale. Ultimately, you have to scale. You know, if you, for such a small institution, if you grow incrementally, even in 25, 30 years, you will not get anywhere. So, therefore, we put out a vision 2015, this was in 2011, that in five or six years, we should be at least 10 times the size. The third was the whole issue that this transformation can happen if you have a l large amount of long-term patient institutional capital, because we needed capital. The next thing was that ultimately when it comes down to implementation, you need to have a very strong governance and risk management architecture, and probably best-in-class management to be able to do this. At that time, we actually put together, actually a board of directors and a senior leadership or management team, which included people of a very high caliber and professional gravitas with a lot of seasoning and people felt that for such a small bank, you know, so many high-powered people, what are they going to do? 
But the whole point was, if you want to create a 10x, 20x, 50x vision for the institution, you need to have people who have done it, who have dealt with scale, who know how to do it, and can therefore lead the organization to that. So it was a combination of all these factors. And how do you create that sense of inclusiveness when you have a workforce where the mindset is in a rural landscape? How do you, how do, you do that? So we said to bind everybody what we need. We put out an ESOP program, which whether somebody is, in, you know, so everybody was treated equally, and ESA program was rolled out to every employee of the institution. Everybody was a stakeholder. So it was a combination of all these factors. So we decided that each of these things have to be put in place, have to be dealt with in combination. The first big challenge, of course, was to change the mindset of people who have been there. Now, that required a certain amount of different kind of leadership. So while we were building functional skills and expertise and putting processes and good structures in place, me and a couple of other my senior colleagues were sitting and parked in Kolhapur for several months and trying to work with people, the staff, the local leaders, the other influence makers to make them believe this new vision and the fact that it can be done. Long story short is the fact that, you know, things started falling in place, we raised the capital and one by one each of these components of our strategy were in place and the confidence in the institution and the transformation process has only grown over time. Now let's come to the strategy part. We said if you're going to be, you know, banking is a B2 subject, we all understand it. So if you're going to compete with the bigger banks and, you know, get somewhere, you need to have certain differentiation in place. And we decided on three plans in terms of our business strategy. First was financial inclusion. You know, post Andhra financial crisis and the other, you know, issues associated with that space, it was still an uncharted territory for most banks. We said we will go there. And our so-called rural semi-urban background helped us, you know, in that journey. And it also enabled us to constantly carry people with us. So that was one big issue, one big decision. The second was that you used a very good point. How did we create an ability to function at a scale far beyond our physical size, you know, distribution and other things. So this, that, we said the model is partnerships, collaboration. And I'll explain that a little bit. And the third point, was that we need to be a new age bank for various reasons. Our image and profile at that time was more like a cooperative bank, which it was not. But that's the kind of customer profile we had. But we said for various reasons, and the way the global landscape is changing, the banking landscape is changing, digital is the way to go. So we said that this bank is going to be a high-tech institution with the best digital platforms, and we will work with each of our components of strategy to ensure that in every sense we are high touch and high, high tech. And that was the philosophy. On financial inclusion, again we said we will work with, you know, corporate business correspondent partners and who will have a downstream distribution capability. So you know, we are working with three, four large corporate PC partners. You know, we were able to create, a, if I may say, either BC branches or customer service points, which are many times our size. To give you a dimension, today we, we had some 70 branches, then we have only 275 branches now. But in addition to that, we have almost a thousand BC branches, half of which are counted as banking outlets in the RBI definition. And in addition, we have more than 1,50,000 customer service points, where, which are powered by a micro ATM or POS and doing financial transactions. So they, that is one way that we have sort of created distribution architecture, where transactions can happen on our platform, and the whole thing is so-called, if I may say, on a very strong digital platform. So right from tap banking at the last mile, going up, while, you know, in terms of underwriting, in terms of processing, if KYC, the whole nine yards, we do that along with this high-touch approach when it comes to outreach. So that's there. We took this concept of partnerships to, you know, other areas and, you know, sort of taking time. So, you know, and we can come back to the question, how we play partnerships or collaboration, you know, on a, on a larger scale across all dimensions of banking. Finally, your question on, you know, whether NBFC. Now, we are partnering with NBFC, with FinTech, with, you know, our largest partnership today on the card side is with one of the best run you know, NBFCs in the country, Bajaj Finance, you know. And so we are co-creating uh, a product, we have a co-branded card, and we are actually 
Today, the fourth or the fifth largest acquirer of new cards in the banking system, which has the fourth or the fifth largest spends per card on top of that. So that is, and they're quite locked in. So I leave it at that for the time being. It's a working model. Fantastic! What a what a powerful story of what has been done. Okay, let's have a big round of applause for this uh, This is today. Just we are in seven years. We are thirty times our size. Wow. We are. Uh, 50 times our profitability, and we are almost 50 times the market value. Awesome. I'm sure many of us want to be in very similar situations and both and of you. BCG has been a very close partner. So okay, here is. Please, please, please take a note of this very important tip that's yeah. coming your way so from the panelists. When it comes to agile, responsible, responsive banking, so right. we are an example. We are consult having a good consultant as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, well, let's. Change gears. You know, these are stories, and we can always look back at the stories and feel very warm and nice about it. But these stories are already done. Let's hear from a man who is has now taken the mantle of creating even maybe even a more powerful story. We are going to turn our attention to Karnataka Bank. Now, again, uh, MS, I have picked up again something from your analyst reports and from the investor presentations. You know, there are multiple angles that you have put out in public domain to your transformation journey. You've spoken about the growth part, you have spoken about the optimization part, you have spoken about the engagement part, you have also spoken about the improvisation part. In addition to all of that, again, I want to put a market factoid in the picture, which is the whole thing about the MSME and we have been hearing about that. Look, the GST is really, and the big governor also mentioned about that. GST has been really a very powerful lever to formalize. In just one year, we have five percentage points addition to the MSMEs which have come into the formal sector. And by 2023, that number is going to go to 20. But that number is going to go to 85 percent. So my two questions for you are the following. One is transformations are very contextual. You, know, you have your starting position, you have your employer base, you have your customer base. Three to five years from now, how will you think of costs and benefits of your program? And two, transformations can be long and difficult. How do you work on change of mindset to take everyone along, especially when you have long and legacy organizations? For Karnataka Bank, which is in existence for the last 94 years, we will be celebrating our centenary year by 2024. So that is the timeline that we have set for ourselves for the transformation of this first generation bank. The necessity for transformation as we understood the present day distinctive features of banking. All the bankers would agree that at present whatever the income generating capacity that we have that is not undoubtedly decreasing whereas our provision requirement is increasing. Even though we look for recapitalization and all such things, this capital is being utilized to bridge this gap. As said, the new capital that is being introduced is not fueling the growth. This is the reality. The second one is banking activities are also being redefined. The banking is also being redefined. If you closely look at the presentations that we have heard right from the inaugural session till the previous session today, two things are very clear. One is Banking hereafter will be a technology company with a banking license. We have been hearing this particular definition for since last two to three years. The second one is most important is in future definitely we may have more banking, more digital touch points, but the big question is about how many banks as well as 
how many branches. In the essence, this is very clear that technology will drive banking in future. Banking sector has seen the first IT-based revolution when we embarked upon CBS, core banking solution, that was from 1998 to 2010. The big question is, are we ready for the second IT revolution wherein all our credit decisions are driven by IT? Hence, to put it in the right context, why Karnataka Bank has embarked upon transformation of the century for the bank is that we would like to continue to be a relevant bank even under the stiff competitive environment. Hence, to survive and continue to be relevant, this transformation journey is embarked upon. And uh, from three to five years now, the cost to benefit of this transformation program, everything. I'm not looking at it as a cost at all. Definitely you all agree with me that any bank which would embark upon transformation, it would be an investment. So this sort of mindset is required for the top management as well as the board and then only that particular bank would have a bright future. So this is something which is beyond the numbers, Ashish. The cost benefit uh, analysis, it is beyond the numbers and definitely the benefit will outweigh the real cost whatever that is being uh, incurred. Definitely the transformation is long and difficult. I always, whenever I interact with my colleagues, I always say that transformation is something like a short-term pain for a long-term gain. This we have to always bear in mind. And not only that, Mr. Mahapatra has said that it's a continuous process. I would further add that it is a work in progress. So that type of uh, mindset is required. I'm fortunate that Karnataka Bank has set that type of transformation tone for itself. And that is what we are looking forward to put Karnataka Bank in a totally different perspective by 2024. And the key for this is our ability to adapt. Thank you. Yeah. Let's show our appreciation to MS and the uh, Nashka Bank team for a uh, very courageous journey they are about to undertake and they have already signed that. Uh, our best to, to the entire bank uh, and banking fraternity at Karnataka Bank. So let's switch gears. Let's put the elephant in the room right here. Okay, we have another panelist coming here which didn't happen. So Ashu, this is to you. The NDA challenge is real, right? Well, we have all these nice stories. The NPS continue to rise. These numbers are still not stopping. The graph is running up north, and that's not a north graph you want to look at, which is also starting to result in falling profitability. And MS just mentioned that the new capital is not doing, it's not fueling growth. It is just being used to cover up all the losses that are coming up in the industry. So the three questions for you are, because you have a vantage point to sit behind and have a look and strategize, how do banks reshape their balance sheets and nurse them back to health? Do you see the stressed asset problems that banks are facing peaking, have peaked anytime soon? And we speak a lot about the credit decisions and there was a gentleman from one of the banks who spoke about the challenges in the digital credit models given the, the data all over the place. So what do you think are, are the banks ready to embrace these credit decisions tools that are disrupting the financial markets? Thanks, Ashish. I guess you've called me at a time when you've heard good things so far. Uh, it has always uh, another side to the coin, right? But I'd say that uh, there's no doubt that uh, the stress 
in the system is for girls. And uh, if we looked at FY80 numbers, the March numbers for NPAs uh, from 11, it's 11.6 percent. So that tells you the story. Uh, point to note is that's after the federal circular. And therefore, you did see uh, the fourth quarter of the last fiscal, uh, a big, big spike as far as NPAs go. I think from our vantage point, looking at the whole system across public sector banks, uh, the large and the small uh, uh, banks, as well as you know the differentiated uh, licensed banks, a couple of things definitely uh, stand out. Uh, there is a move towards a credit culture. Now, why do I say that? I say that because if you looked at five years ago, the ratio of stressed assets to NPAs would be uh, 2x. Whereas now, if you look at stressed assets to NPAs, it's like 14 and 11.6%. So that 2x has come down to 1.2x. I mean, that is, yes, you can uh, say a lot about the federal circular, but I think banks have begun uh, to recognize uh, the problem. And as always, uh, unless you accept or recognize a problem, you don't uh, fix it. We're at a time when uh, a number of policy moves have happened. Uh, and I know uh, Siddhi is going to speak uh, right after me. And I think the whole insolvency uh, code, the IBC is a big step. And we are beginning to see a move uh, and, and we saw a large uh, uh, NPA getting uh, resolved. So if I look at it, uh, I would say the NPA levels have uh, peaked in that sense. You could see some more stress. Now, I don't see it going completely out of act. So it will you know, be maybe for another year between 11 and 12, is it going to sort of run away to 14, 15 percent, at least at this point, you don't uh, see that happening. And we don't see that happening for a couple of reasons. First, uh, if you look at it, uh, banks have done a lot uh, to get their balance sheets to look much better. And it's not only the banks, but uh, predominantly the corporate sector, which is where the lumpy NPAs sit, uh, which is certainly uh, looking to be in a much uh, healthier situation. And a couple of data points, right? Look at corporate India. It's raised over 2.3 lakh crores in equity. I would say that's a pretty large number. You can go back. Uh, I, I don't recall seeing that numbers, certainly post uh, the global financial crisis. At the same time, uh, if you look at overall gearing, it's come off. It's 1x versus 1.4x about three years ago. If you look at uh, interest um, cover ratios, uh, that's looking better, 2.8 versus 2.3. So naturally, if corporate India is looking healthier, uh, it's a good sign for banks because one, uh, you know, you're going to see some of the borderline cases not slip but uh, continue to remain uh, current. And you can see it from the SMA to number of accounts and the data that's out there. Uh, but the bigger thing is uh, you see a lot more corporates retiring debt. And that's simply because you don't see revival in private capex. Now, that's not good news from an economic growth perspective. But you know, staying with the theme around balance sheets, that augurs well for banks. That's about what's contributed, uh, contributing to their balance sheets external to the banks. If I look at the steps being taken internally, there are two or three good things uh, that have happened. One, uh, regardless of the size, scale, or which part of the banking system uh, the bank is, whether public, uh, large private, or small private, uh, the big theme is around diversification. There is a conscious effort to build the retail book. There's a conscious effort to build the SME book. And diversification from a balance sheet perspective is good news. I also see a big effort towards unlocking the value of the deposit base. 
it's not yet showing up in uh, free income but it's definitely steps that are taking you start everybody nowadays talks about cross sell transformation tracking i mean all uh, the people who've spoken uh, before me have uh, spoken about the transformation agenda and that augurs very well uh, for balance sheets and most importantly having recognized the npa situation uh, there is strong effort towards uh, remediation it's not only waiting for nclt but i think uh, banks have uh, separate cells now and uh, i would say uh, the, the last thing uh, there has begun to be investments from a risk management uh, point of view as crucial beyond uh, banks subscribing to uh, rating analytics some of our risk management tools particularly the early warning signals uh, some of the credit processing systems that we have banks have begun adopting and that creates a, a kind of a contributor towards avoiding a problem uh, in future so that's the way i see uh, the banking system um, you know and, and the effort being put in from a embracing new tools perspective i think there isn't a choice right um, you can't continue to do things in the past because if you continue to do things like you did in the past you're going to ra land right back where you are the second thing uh, the external world has changed right when your customers change it's very important for you as a bank to shift as well now if the strategy is to diversify to move away from just lending to the large Uh, corporates to mid-sized and uh, small corporates and retail you have to digitize you have to adopt technology also increasingly when you go down the credit spectrum you find that you cannot only rely on financial data you have to begin to calibrate from other data points whether it is it returns whether it is Uh, you know the movement in the bank banking statements. I mean, a lot comes out, and we ourselves see in the course of our discussions that it's nice to be um, the main consortium bank, but you find that most of uh, the action doesn't go through your main bank. And you may be the main banker, but you certainly don't have a whole product. And that's where advanced credit decisioning tools play a big role because they allow you to take. financial data operational data risk data and unstructured data from all the news around you and the action around you to make the right uh, credit decisions and more important to survey the people you lend to because the problem isn't about the right credit decision it is when do you stop lending more and when do you step up collection or actually look at ways of prepayment and i think uh, there is far more openness there are very good discussions some banks have adopted them i believe that once the discussion starts it's a matter of time some some banks move quicker some take uh, longer thank you very much i think uh, yeah this have a big round of thanks for actually actually your words around this is speaking and and some of the analysis that you gave us i think will soothe a lot of nervousness among bankers so we really hope Uh, we have seen the worst, and probably we are starting to be already on the journey to move forward. Uh, Ashwin, you mentioned something interesting about IBC, and I think that's where CBI is going to pick the next piece with you. Is the glass half full or half empty? Right? Uh, a lot of hope, a lot of promise, uh, yet things are moving a bit slow. So this is the first list of twelve. The green one shows one is done. Uh, the red shows we have all crossed 270 days. The yellow one is we are about to cross 270 days in five days from now. And on top of that, you know there are committees and more recommendations. The recommendations are all creating us just as at AMC or the AIF. Whereas we have specialized ecosystem partners like yourself. So my questions to you are: How good is this framework in India? And and Is this a framework issue? Is this a quality of service provider issue? Are banks using the ecosystem in the right manner? 
Can they use the ecosystem optimally or better? And how are, given the context of the banking industry change, how are partners like yourself responding to the change in the environment? Thanks, Ashish. In fact, uh, just a few data points on your chart you uh, displayed there. Uh, FY15, it was 4.4% uh, of NPAs. But if you remember in FY15, Reserve Bank of India did that AQR. In fact, in the AQR, it was found that additionally around 6.7% of the assets were under stress. So if you add these two, it was in FY15, it was 11.1% stress in the system. If you look from that perspective, today we are looking at around 12.5, maybe around that. Maybe March it could be around 12.5. In that way, the slippages has been far less actually, if you 11.1 to 12.5. That, that's according to me is a positive thing. Uh, I mean, the acceleration has reduced a lot. Uh, almost all assets have been identified. Uh, maybe a little more stress could be in the power system, in the power generation sector, uh, which, uh, uh, which would be provided for maybe in the next one year or so. So, to my mind, the total stress in the system could be in the range of 13, 13.5 if we have all the power generation companies together. Now, coming, uh, coming to the ARC system. In fact, the ARC system is a system, as I call it an infrastructure available. It is uh, uh, more misunderstood than it is known. Because of the, its, its evolution over a period of time. It was conceived as an agent of a bank initially. Thanks to Raghuram Rajan, he converted it into a, a partner. Uh, from uh, FY15 onwards, the ARCs have been working as a partner to the bank. Why I say that? Because the it is no more based on a management fee from business. It's an investment decision, and uh, uh, Raghuram Rajan's uh, points, two points where the skin of ARC should be more, and the bank should price the asset correctly. And the ARCs can buy an asset only if the price is right, because management fee won't even cover your cost of capital. And more importantly, management fee, 15% upfront, what is given, banks can recover that whatever management fee they give to an ARC. Of course, nobody gives a management fee, you need to collect it. 15%, uh, I mean, banks can redeploy and get back that whatever management fee is given to an ARC. So ARC is an excellent system, actually. It's a very good infrastructure which should have been used more by the banks. We are a partner in the, in the and to my mind, is the best and most efficient system of bringing down the headline gross NPA number. Today, if you really look at why private sector banks and public sector banks have wide variation when the assets fund funded by them are almost same. If you look at all large companies, one of the RBI data I was looking at, 40% uh, of the Indian, 40-45% of the total lending is to large corporates. And stress, large corporates in the total, I uh, mean, uh, NPAs, uh, large corporates forms really I'm told around 70%. It's, it's, it's an amazing I mean, When I saw that data, I was also amazed. 70% are large assets. I mean, in, in the in the NP industry system. 70% uh, are contributed by the large corporates. 
I would say private sector have, private sector and banks have used ARCs as a much better tool to manage in uh, In fact, uh, public sectors, there is a reason, of course there is a reason. I mean, market capitalization is and gross headline MPA number is, a, is an issue which you need to look at. Public sector, unfortunately, I also come from a public, public sector bank that way. Uh, I come from, I mean, my bank was IDBI, which is in the news for all wrong reasons too. Uh, but it's 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 a absolutely totally a wholesale bank, so it's not not surprising that it has more MPAs. I do think they uh, all these public sector banks should have used ARC framework as an effective tool to reduce the NBA risks. Uh, <coughs> unfortunately, I think I should confess, the there is a perceptual issue about ARCs because many bankers tell me ARCs are not proved. They have not proved regarding the recovery. This is due, it's purely a perceptual issue because the institutional memory is when the ARCs were an agent of a bank. As an agent of a bank, I mean, when the assets transferred to an ARC were all junk assets. Because you know, every bank has a recovery department. When nothing is possible in those, it used to be transferred to an ARC early. Thanks to Rajan, he changed that. In his first speech, I remember he said, banks should utilize ARCs. Fresh NPAs should be transferred to ARC's work so that they can reconstruct them. It's a big partnership. With the public sector bank, I wish they, we have been trying to, uh, I mean, uh, discuss, we have been trying to discuss with them about the benefits. In fact, the number of cases we have revived, because ours is a revival oriented as a partnership. The number of assets we have revived over these last four years, ever since um, we became a partner to the bank, it's amazing. Actually, I can uh, count number of cases which, anyway, that's not, it's not the forum for that. Uh, so, this ecosystem is, should be used, utilized by the banks. That's what all I can see. And uh, uh, as Ashish said, uh, perhaps we, we are, as an ARC, as a class, could not prove much so far or advertise so much what we have done so far. At times, talks of discussions of bad bank comes up. I was the first one to handle a bad bank in this country. I was handling the bad bank of IDB at that point of time. Bad bank, according to me, is, is not a good concept, according to me, because a bad bank can only warehouse the assets. A bad bank, a bank has to provide additional funding if you have to provide a company which is in distress. So a bad bank, uh, uh, if it uh, gives additional funding, I think uh, uh, the managing director will not get his post retirement benefits. The, that's the problem because just for giving a loan to Kingfisher, perhaps Yogesh Agarwal had to go behind bars. I mean, this is very unfortunate. I mean, uh, we, we should sympathize with the public sector banks in that way. What I was telling, we even look at the way we have our foresight on this. Today, we are talking of the Shashakt scheme. Uh, where, whereas the same Shashakt scheme we have already implemented. We have an AMC, we have an AIF, uh, ARC, uh, NBFC also. So, I mean, if we can't resolve as, as an asset like that, I mean, no amount of Shashakt will work in this connection for us. It's the pricing, frankly. I think uh, I should tell my banking friends that um, ARC's ecosystem is very good because the banks retain their side. Today, if you really look at the IBC system, we are talking about the 20 dozen, uh, where the, you mentioned about the number of days elapsed. 
I mean, perhaps that's a good thing. I mean, why the purpose of referring the 12 cases to IBC was to test the uh, law. The law is getting tested, so there is a slow back and forth in the in the uh, IBC or NCLT. I think that's not a bad thing. It's happening because uh, decisions or precedences that has to happen, it should be well thought of and well decided. That's where this back and forth, the dirty lesson, I don't, I don't think it's a negative thing. It's work. It shows that IBC is working well. I mean, uh, we feel in another uh, two to three months time, all the entire, all the 12 cases should be resolved. And uh, we are a big stakeholder in this, uh, many of the strong cases. And uh, we feel the recovery will be very good. Uh, very good in the, in the cases where asset quality is good, like steel. Uh, maybe some sectors like EPC, uh, you may not get much. But the system works very well. Only we should have some discretion what cases to be referred to NCLT and what not. What should not be referred to NCLT. That again depends on the banking, uh, the, the bank management. Uh, to my mind, uh, EPC or the power sector, these are not, uh, IBC is not a solution for these sectors. Uh, these sectors can be very well revived by an ARC system. Uh, why I say that so about the power system? Okay. Uh, if you permit me. I think this is a fantastic point you're making. Both a combination of uh, IBC and ARC, which I think have not been fully leveraged. I think it's a key point that you have mentioned, and I think audience should take that back with them. Maybe we can have a round of applause for CB as well. Thank you very much for telling us about fantastic points around ARC. Look, uh, the panelists here must have done a fantastic job for this much audience to survive at 6.30 p.m. So I'll give it back to you. Do you have any questions for the panelists? Because I have otherwise a rapid fire round coming up. So let's hear if you have any questions for our esteemed panelists here. Okay, you can think about it. I have two rapid fire questions. Meets force collection of many facets. And we will not speak about strategy and culture, so forget about those two points. Operations or process, organization, HR people, or IT and tech. What will be your starting point and sequence if you have to transform your organization? On the mic. On the mic. People is very important. People is what ma people management in any, any okay. sector. What next? After people? And technology. And technology. So people and technology. Ashu. People, operations, technology. People, operations, technology. Undoubtedly, it is HR and uh, people. Then comes the IT. HR and IT. HR and IT. HR and IT. Fantastic. That's like a really a very convergent house. People and IT. Please, a big round of applause for the, uh, for the panelists here. Do you have any questions from the audience? After the second rapid fire, the, the house will be closed and there will be no more chance of asking a question to this panel. Any hands? Okay, so we come to an end to our panel with a second question. We'll start with you, Vishwameen. Describe in two or three words of phrase your mantra to be successful in a transformation journey. Uh, ability to not have long-term strategies, but to handle the navigation principles really, really well. Because in a very dynamic, challenging environment, you know, you know, uh, basically you need to know how to navigate the best. Okay. Mr. Mopata. A vision and team building. Vision and team building. Team building. Coming together to create a bank of millennials. Okay. Millennials. Creating agility right from the top to the bottom to deliver innovative solutions to the changing marketplace. Mm -hmm. Adaptability to the changes, people management and uh, optimization of capital. This was a lovely panel. Thank you very much for being so participative and sharing your thoughts. Thank you very much.